Hello, my name is Joe Hildreth, and welcome to episode 13 of CNC for the Home Hobbyist. In this episode, I want to discuss linear motion systems and how to compute the number of steps required for the units selected in your project. I feel I should tell you that I'm not a machinist, an engineer, or a teacher, but rather a home hobbyist that would like to share my experience with Linux CNC controller and CNC controlled machines for the home shop. As I release videos on various topics over time, it is my hope that other hobbyists can use the information in their attempts to make their own CNC machines. I hope, through the course of these videos, that the learning curve will also be flattened somewhat. Additionally, perhaps, some folks will avoid some of the more common problems that I encountered along the way. With that out of the way, let's get started. When I discuss linear motion, I'm referring to the means by which an axis is moved from one point to another. I'm not concerned at this time with linear bearing system employed. Linear bearings or slides will be discussed in a later video. There are two main methods of moving an axis on a machine. These are the lead screw and the rack and pinion. It could be argued that there are others, but I feel like cable drive and cogged or gear belt drives are really just another form of rack and pinion in practice, with the exception with the gear belt and its pulleys used for gear reduction. More on that later. There are pros and cons for each of these methods of driving a linear axis. You'll have to decide which is best for your application. So, the lead screw. The pros for the lead screw are well, final resolution and less motor movement. They're relatively inexpensive even for a multi-start variety and the thread is designed for linear loads. The cons on the other hand are slower motion for a given motor speed and the screw will tend to whip if it's very long. The rack and pinion, well, the pros for the rack and pinion system include much greater speed than a lead screw and they're good for long travel distances. The cons are that they have lower positioning accuracy and are subject to backlash. Before delving into either the lead screw or the rack and pinion, I want to discuss the machine unit. The machine unit will be the unit of measure in which your machine will be built and calibrated. For most in the United States, that would be the inch, while European and other countries would most likely use the millimeter. When configuring Linux CNC with the step comp utility for using stepper motors, you will need to select the machine unit. The selected machine unit will affect the remaining step comp wizard dialogs. The unit that you select, either inch or millimeter, will be entirely up to you. But it should be noted that the configuration would be simpler if you selected the unit that corresponds with the lead screw that you're using, if, in fact, you're using a lead screw. But don't let this deter you. Converting from inch to millimeters and the other way around is simple enough. Selecting a machine unit does not in any way impact your ability to machine parts in the non-selected unit. For example, if you set your machine up in inches, there is no reason that you cannot machine your part to metric lengths. It is only used in the initial configuration of the machine. What is a lead screw? A lead screw is a threaded rod designed to convert the rotary motion of the screw into linear motion through the nut which it is engaged. This works by holding or fixing the screw in place so that it cannot move axially and affixing the nut to a sliding member that allows the nut to travel along the screw. Lead screws are typically made in two varieties. The first type is the ball screw. The ball screw uses recirculating ball bearings to minimize friction and maximize efficiency and are typically used for heavy or high load application. The second type is a screw that has a thread form of either the Acme or metric trapezoidal thread type. This type of screw depends on low coefficients between the sliding surfaces to transmit power. Most hobbyists will elect to use this type of screw due to the fact that they are, generally, much cheaper than ball screws. Some hobbyists may elect to use a standard threaded rod having a 60 degree thread form as a lead screw. I myself have done this and, well, they will work, but I should point out that this type of thread will put an axial thrust or an outward pressure on the nut and has a higher friction coefficient than a trapezoidal thre- type thread. What this means in the end is that you'll have 
a little less performance from your machine than you would get from a real lead screw. How much? I have no idea. But if that's all you have available as threaded rod to use as a lead screw, don't let that stop you from building a machine. There's a certain vernacular associated with threads that you should familiarize yourself with. Fortunately, there's no need to learn them all. For our needs, we only need to learn three of them. These will be useful in helping us to configure Linux CNC. Pitch. Pitch is the distance between the crest of one thread to the crest of the next thread in line. For metric threads, pitch is measured in millimeters, and for imperial threads, it's measured in inches. TPI. Threads per inch is a common term used to describe imperial threads. For example, a lead screw may be expressed as having 10 threads per inch. To convert a TPI to pitch, simply divide 1 by the TPI value. So the lead screw above would have a pitch of 1 divided by 10, or 0 .100 inch. Lead. The lead of a thread is the distance it travels axially in one revolution. For a screw with a single thread, this would be the same as the pitch. However, it is common to make lead screws containing more than a single th uh, thread called starts. These can be found in two, three, or even more starts. To find the distance of the lead, multiply the number of threads by the pitch. For example, if I had a lead screw with 10 threads per inch and 5 starts, or threads, I would first find the pitch. 1 divided by 10 equals 0 .100 inch and then multiply this value by the number of threads. So, 0 .100 times 5 equals 0 .500 inch, or a half an inch. I've placed a couple of images on the screen to help visualize these terms. What is a rack and pinion? An alternate method of providing linear motion is with a rack and pinion. A rack and pinion consist of a small gear, called the pinion, that engages a straight gear, called a rack and, like the lead screw, converts rotary motion of the pinion to linear motion along the rack. Rack and pinion drives are very useful for machines that have long travel distances and the need for speed. Just like the lead screw, it has a set of words that describes the structure of its components and it will benefit us to know the meaning of a few of them. Diametral pitch, DP. The diametral pitch of a gear expresses the number of teeth the gear has per inch of pitch diameter. Gears made in the USA and the UK are commonly sized in this manner. So for example, a gear that is 1 inch in pitch diameter having 20 teeth will have a diametral pitch of 20. The diametral pitch of a gear can be calculated by counting the teeth on the gear and adding 2 to this value. Then, divide this total by the measured outside diameter of the gear in question. The answer will be the whole number resulting from the equation disregarding any fractional remainder. This would be useful if you were repurposing a rack and a pinion from some other device. Pitch Diameter D. The pitch diameter refers to the diameter of the pitch circle that the teeth engage upon. Knowing this is critical to learn how far the gear will travel in one revolution and can be easily calculated. This will be covered later in more detail. Recall from the last slide that I told you that rack and pinion drives were great for covering large distances and high speed. The problem with the latter is that to gain the speed you lose the ability to accurately position the axis. To help with this, you can use gear reduction between the stepper motor and the pinion to increase the positioning accuracy. There are two methods available for doing reductions. The first being a direct gear to gear mesh. This method, however, is not the most ideal because of the backlash that exists between the meshed gear teeth. This backlash or the small space that exists between the teeth is thereby designed and provides a longer service life for the gears. It should be noted that Linux CNC can compensate for backlash and the method of measuring it will be presented in a future video. 
The second method of doing reduction is by using a special toothed pulley and a toothed belt that run on them. The backlash is eliminated through tension and tension idlers. This is the most common solution for gear reduction and it is commonly seen. The same concept can be used to drive a linear axis of a machine and it is common in smaller machines and printers. A reduction takes place when a smaller gear or pulley drives the larger gear or pulley. The amount of reduction is based on the ratio of the teeth between them. For example, if a 20 tooth gear is used to drive a 60 tooth gear, then the gear reduction would be 3 to 1. Where to from here? I've covered the basic types of linear motion available to the home hobbyist, but will still need to cover some basic calculations with you for determining the number of steps required to move the axis one machine unit. I intended to cover these in this episode, but in the interest in keeping the series in small digestible chunks, I've elected to break it out into another part. The next episode, I'll cover these calculations. As always, Thank you for taking the time from your busy life to watch my videos. If the videos I produce help you, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. CNC is an exciting and rewarding addition to the home shop, and if you have friends that are thinking of getting into it, please consider sending them my way. Other than that, have a blessed day.